Shalom, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I'll just say that I, I sent the link about the story about the Geonim uh, in the WhatsApp group, and I made all the comments about Ezra and the different people that you met uh, in the comments on the video from yesterday. So if you want to go check that out. So today we'll hopefully finish uh, this section about Nusach. Um, there's three major ideas. One is uh, uh, what happens when your parents themselves uh, changed um, their, their Nusach. Uh, the second one is the people who are Ashkenazim and uh, Daven with a, a pronunciation that's different from what they grew up in. The third one is what to do when there's members of different communities, which we touched on a few times, uh, and we said that usually it's a majority. So sometimes the question arises regarding how a person should practice when his father, who is a member of one ethnic group, becomes accustomed to praying in the Nusach of a different ethnic group. Should he pray in the Nusach in which his father currently prays or in the Nusach of his father's original ethnic group? As a general rule, the obligatory minhag is that of the is that of the ethnic group and not one's father's individual minhag. However, when the son prefers to continue on his father's adopted nusach, or because he finds it difficult to change for any other reason, uh, he is permitted to continue praying in his father's new nusach. Uh, since this question poses implications on other issues, it is best that one consult with his rabbi on this matter. A similar dilemma arose among members of Hasidic families who learned in Lithuania, Lithuanian yeshivas uh, and became accustomed to praying in Nusach Ashkenaz. When they left the yeshiva, they deliberated whether to continue praying in Nusach Ashkenaz as they were taught or return to praying in their parents' minhag, which was a Sephard Hasidi, uh, the minhag of their parents. The rabbis of the Ashkenazi minhag taught that in principle they must continue praying in Nusach Ashkenaz, for in the past all Ashkenazic Jews prayed in Nusach Ashkenaz, and only 200 years ago did everybody start changing everything, uh, and that complicated uh, things. Um, last but not least about that, one of my friends, um, his father became a Baal Tshuva, and it's been three or four generations since there was actual minhag of the family, so he basically, his rabbi suggested that because he was doing a very difficult change, that he should just go with the easiest for him, uh, whether it's in terms of tefillah or in terms of eating rice on Pesach or in terms of uh, even laws of uh, waiting for six hours after meat. Uh, and so that's also something that we can consider. And, and of course, we talk about how somebody wants to come closer to be part of a community. Uh, it might be easier to just change the Nusach and continue in that way. In practice, since there are differing opinions, the person posing the question may choose how to practice. Still, it is best to consult with one's rabbi on this matter. And the rabbi might know things that, that the person doesn't know. For example, he might know that there's a shul right around the corner from the where this person lives that davens with the nusach that he originally had. So maybe this guy isn't even aware of that, of that synagogue. So that's why uh, it's good to ask leaders of our community. A similar question arose among Ashkenazi immigrants from the Dati Lomi National Religious Community. Approximately three generations ago, with the beginning of the gathering of the exiles, a need was felt to consolidate the diaspora communities and to restore the Jewish nation to its Hebrew language. For unification purpose, the Sephardic pronunciation was chosen. Even though Maran Rav Kulk Zutal and many other poskim are of the opinion that each ethnic group must preserve its own accent and prayer, especially like we talked about earlier this week, that the whole community moved together. In actuality, since the spoken Hebrew and the Hebrew learned in schools were in a Sephardic pronunciation, the Sephardic accent became embedded in the prayer service too. Uh, of course, in the um, Hasidic and Yeshivish communities, they speak Yiddish. They don't even speak the Hebrew language as, as a Lashon Fol. So that he's not talking to those people. Those people also don't usually read this book. They have their own post game. So uh, he's talking specifically about the Datilo Mi uh, adopting these kinds of practices and also the Datilo Mi going to the army. And so 
sometimes I remember that there was sometimes that the majority of us were Sephardim and we just changed the 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 mag for for that Shabbat, and that's actually in the last paragraph of this chapter. So. Indeed, many leaders of national religious educational institutions acting in accordance with the rulings of a few rabbis instructed the Ashkenazic students to pray with the Sephardic pronunciation. There are some rabbis who spoke strongly against the Ashkenazim, who changed their accent. Um, some taught that even people who find it difficult to pronounce all the prayers in the Ashkenazic pronunciation must at least pronounce Hashem's name in that manner. Uh, so, um, with with the name Elohim, there's no difference. But um, the Aleph Dalit Nun Yud underneath the Nun is a Kamatz, and so the question is to do it as a as a Kamatz or a Patach, like the Sephardi do, or to do O, oh, like Ado Noi, um, in that manner, because the pronunciation of Hashem's name in Ashkenazic accent has greater grammatical advantages. I am not really into that, but I mean, like you said, however, in practice, most rabbis do not encourage their students to change their pronunciation since the Sephardic accent is just as acceptable as Ashkenazic and everyone is used to it. There is no obligation to return to one's original accent. Uh, this morning, I realized that I was uh, in a minion that was uh, Ashkenaz, which I thought was Sephard, so it was a little bit confusing. And we'll conclude with members of different ethnic groups that prank together. And if, as a rule, we already said before that we go by the majority if possible. And in many places, members of all different ethnic groups pray together. That is the accepted practice in many yeshivot, so as not to cause a daily schism between the students, as well as in small communities, which do not have enough people for each group to maintain a large minion to pray and learn Torah. In the past, in order to refrain from disrupting the prayer service and creating separate minhagim within the same synagogue, the congregation would establish one nusach according to the majority. However, in our society, where people are familiar with and accustomed to the different minhagim, in many places it is customary to give each ethnic group expression in the prayer service. And he's going to give two examples that they do in Yeshua Tar Bracha. So, um, and also in the main synagogue in Harbacha. That is how we practice in Harbacha, where when there are major differences between the Minhagim, it is our custom to for follow the shorter Nusach and the more lenient. For example, on Bet Hay Bet, the, the fasts that are Monday and Thursday for a few weeks after uh, Sukkot and a few weeks after um, um, uh, Shavuos, um, I think. Um, when the Ashkenazim customarily say Slichot, we do not recite them communally since the Sephardim do not follow this custom. Similarly, Shira Shirin, the Song of Songs, or the Song of Solomon, is not recited before Kabbalah Shabbat, though it is the minhag of many Sephardim. And, and, and likewise, we do not recite all the passages of the Korbanot out aloud in the Minyan as, as a Sephardic tradition. Those who wish to say them, recite them individually before the prayer service. And my grandfather actually, uh, he, he used to go to a minion that was very, very quick. So uh, he would just stay in shul for about 15 minutes afterwards and, and say all the korbanot and all the other additions that were, he was accustomed to. However, when the extension of the prayer service is not burdensome, the congregation follows the chazan, for instance, at the end of the prayer service, when the Sephardim prolong the recital of the song of the day and the people, Pitum uh, Torah or the Tachnon of Monday and Thursdays. Um, it's yes, it is longer, but it's longer for all communities. So it's uh, what's the difference between one and the other? Um, last but not least, uh, in in Nakipa, where my parents uh, daven for so many years, uh, they decided to also do Hagba before the Torah reading uh, as well as after, uh, in order to accommodate both the party and the Ashkenazim. So we'll just finish with uh, with this paragraph. As a general rule regarding prayers recited out loud, the congregation follows the chazan while concerning prayers recited silently. Each person prays according to his individual minrag. Nonetheless, it is unnecessary to be meticulous concerning this. 
and one who wishes to pray in the Chazan's Nusach is permitted to do so, for that is the opinion of St. Poskim. Especially if you come to Shul and you don't have your usual sitter, and you pick up, let's say, for me, I'll pick up a Sephardi sitter, and it, it'll be much easier to just follow, even in the Sanat Amida, what it says in the sitter, as opposed to trying to figure out uh, where the differences are in the wording, uh, because then I will completely lose my concentration, and that's just my personal opinion.